Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on the menstrual cycle. Now, before you watch this, make sure you've watched the previous video on hormones and diabetes, as this will explain all the basics of hormones and how they work. So, in this video, we'll be looking at the female reproductive system, the menstrual cycle, the way that hormones control the menstrual cycle, then we'll look at contraception and assisted reproductive technologies. Now, Okay, so we're going to look now at the structure of the female reproductive system. This is super important because the whole of the rest of the video really depends on this knowledge. Now, if we start at the bottom of the diagram, we have the vagina. Um, this is where sperm is deposited during sexual intercourse. Next, we have the uterus, this region up here. This is um, also sometimes known as the womb, and it is where a fetus develops during pregnancy. Now, in order to swim from the vagina to the uterus, the sperm must pass through a narrow channel called the cervix. Now, the cervix is very narrow. It's only about two and a half centimetres wide. Um, and if you can imagine during childbirth, a baby's head has got to pass through that. So that has to really stretch. And that's one of the reasons why childbirth is so painful. Next, we have the uterus lining, sometimes known as the endometrium. And you can see that here. So if you look carefully on the walls of the uterus, we've got that, that sort of red lining there. Now, this is very soft tissue with lots of blood that is there to nourish an embryo early in a pregnancy. We have the ovaries. Got two ovaries, one there, one on each side, one there, one there. Um, and their job is to release eggs. Um, and we'll see that they're released once each menstrual cycle. And they also produce the female sexual hormones as well, estrogen and progesterone. And then finally, we've got the oviducts, sometimes known as fallopian tubes as well. Um, the oviducts, their job is when an egg is released, the egg will be transported along the oviduct towards the uterus. Um, and because the eggs can't swim, the oviducts are lined with those ciliated epithelial cells that have those little hairs that can waft the eggs along. Now, the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle is an approximately 28-day cycle that prepares the female body for pregnancy. Now, really important, it naturally varies between about 21 days and about 35 days. So if you're female and listening to this and your cycle isn't, isn't exactly 28 days, that's absolutely fine. Um, if it is less than 21 days or longer than 35 days, you may want to see a doctor. But that, that, that range is perfectly natural. Now, there are several main stages of the menstrual cycle. We'll base all of these on a 28-day cycle, um, and these are all kind of average values. So again, if, if what I'm saying doesn't match your experience, that probably doesn't mean anything's wrong. It's just the human body's not a machine, and different bodies work slightly differently. So state the first stage we refer to as menstruation is days one to seven. Now, menstruation, or just your period, is when the uterus lining breaks down and it leaves the body through the vagina and that's what you know that's what the period is it's that that mixture of kind of um, blood and soft tissue from that uh, from the uterus lining breaking down next um, between days 8 to 13 the uterus lining which you can see at the moment is very thin that uterus lining gradually gets thicker and thicker and thicker on day 14 we have maybe the most important event in some ways, called ovulation. Um, ovulation is the release of an egg from one of the ovaries. And you can see that egg there, that tiny little speck, that is the egg that's been released. Uh, and over the next few days, it will travel along the oviducts. So you can see there it goes there, being wafted along by those ciliated epithelial cells. Now, on days 15 to 28 of the menstrual cycle, the thickness of the uterus lining is maintained, so it stays nice and thick and able to accommodate a, um, a, a developing embryo should fertilization take place. But if no embryo does get implanted, then the uterus lining will break down again and we go back around the menstrual cycle. So we find ourselves back on days one to seven with menstruation with that period and the whole thing repeats again. So now we need to understand the role of hormones in controlling the menstrual cycle. We'll start off by looking at the foundation tier slide and then we'll look at the higher tier stuff which goes into a bit more detail. So in foundation tier we're going to look at the idea that there are two main hormones controlled 
in, involved in controlling the menstrual cycle, which are estrogen and progesterone. Now, if we look at a graph of estrogen over time throughout the days of the menstrual cycle, so starting at day zero, go through seven, 14, onto 28, and so on, okay? We can see that the red line representing estrogen starts off low and then it begins to rise. Now, as it rises, we can see that this increasing concentration of estrogen causes a thickening of the lining of the uterus. That's what this graph below shows us. You then see that the estrogen level spikes around the number two here, and that's actually what triggers ovulation when an egg is released from one of the ovaries. Now comes our second hormone, progesterone, which is represented by the purple line. Now, it stays pretty low throughout the first half of the cycle and only increases after, um, after that ovulation event. Now, when progesterone concentrations are high, as we can see here, that maintains the thickness of the uterus lining and enables it to be able to nourish an embryo should one implant into it. However, over time, you can see the progesterone levels start to drop and that triggers stage four here, uh, where that causes the uterus lining to break down now because the progesterone levels are low and that's what menstruation is or, or the period. So the period is when that uterus lining breaks down and leaves the body through the vagina triggered by those low levels of the progesterone. Okay, so now we're going to look at the higher tier detail for the menstrual cycle and there is a lot of information on this slide. So you will probably want to repeat this slide a few times to let that information sink in. Um, I make no apologies, it is just what you need to know. So we're going to meet a new hormone first of all, and its name is FSH. Just the initials is fine, but it's helpful to know that it stands for follicle stimulating hormone. Now, at the beginning of the menstrual cycle, um, the FSH levels start to rise, and you can see that here. And what that does is that stimulates a follicle in one ovary to mature an egg. So the idea here is that each of the eggs in an ovary is surrounded by a small um, kind of ball of tissue called a follicle, and the follicle will over time mature that egg from an immature, unusable state to a mature, usable state. Now, what happens next is that as that follicle develops, it starts to produce estrogen, and that's why the estrogen levels begin to rise. And we can see that here, we can see on the uh, bottom diagram how the follicle starts off small and because of the effect of follicle stimulating hormone, it gets bigger and bigger, producing more and more estrogen as it does so. Next comes in the estrogen. So we've seen on the previous slide that the estrogen is responsible for stimulating the thickening of the uterus lining. And we can see that here, we can see that as that estrogen is increasing, um, which we can see there, as estrogen increases, um, we can see that the uterus lining starts to get thicker as well. The estrogen also uh, triggers the release of a third hormone called LH, which stands for luteinizing hormone. So you can see here that as these, uh, as the concentration of estrogen starts to get pretty high, that triggers the release of luteinizing hormone, and we get this big spiking luteinizing hormone just there. Okay. Now, what does luteinizing hormone do? Well, its one and only job is to trigger ovulation. So ovulation is the release of an egg, and we can see that ovulation event happening down there. You can see how the follicle has burst open, and it has released that egg. Now, the follicle changes, and it becomes a temporary endocrine gland called the corpus luteum. Now, the corpus luteum slowly shrinks over the next two weeks. You can see that here. So here's our corpus luteum. starts off really big and then it gradually gets smaller and eventually just withers away. But the corpus luteum, its job whilst it's still there is to release progesterone. So progesterone is released from the corpus luteum. So if we, if we sort of marry up the graph, you can see it, um, that once we've got the corpus luteum, our progesterone levels start to increase. Now what that does is the high progesterone levels maintain the thickness of the uterus lining. Um, and it also inhibits the release of further FSH by that process of negative feedback. So high progesterone prevents further 
FSH being released, which, pre which prevents a further follicle from developing. Now, as that corpus luteum slowly shrinks and withers away, like you can see there, um, that causes the progesterone levels to drop, as we can see happening here. Um, and then that triggers the process of menstruation, where the uterus lining breaks down and leaves the body through the vagina. As I said at the start of this slide, you'll probably want to watch this one a few times. So do pause it, go back to the beginning and just watch it until that detail starts to sink in. OK, so now we're going to look at the idea of hormonal contraception. So contraception in general is just methods for preventing sexual intercourse from resulting in a pregnancy. There are two types. We're going to look at hormonal and barrier contraception. So hormonal contraception, um, also known as the pill, uses hormones to prevent pregnancy. And there are a few different kinds. We don't really need the detail of this, but I think it's useful uh, for people to know this because a lot of you uh, may be taking the pill at some point in your life. So there are, broadly speaking, three main types of hormonal contraception. The first one is the combined pill. Now, this is a pill containing both estrogen and progesterone, and it prevents ovulation so that no eggs are released. And it can also prevent periods as well, which many women uh, find is a, is a valuable thing. Now, the next pill, uh, or the next uh, one we got, is the progesterone-only pill. And this prevents ovulation, but it doesn't stop periods. And also, rather than taking a regular pill, you could take, you could have a, a contraceptive implant placed into your uh, upper arm normally, and that contains progesterone, which is slowly released over a long period of time to take ovulation. The benefit of that is that you can't forget to take it, um, you know, so that it means that you're 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 less likely to get pregnant through forgetfulness. Which, trust me, if I was a woman, I would definitely uh, have to get the implant because uh, I would, there's no way I would remember to take my pills. Anyway, now, um, in terms of evaluation, um, the con hormonal contraception is 99% effective when used according to the instructions. What that means is of 100 couples having regular unprotected sex whilst the female is using um, hormonal contraception, only one of those couples would get pregnant uh, each year and 99 would not. Really important is that... Um, hormonal contraception has zero effect against the spread of sexually transmitted infections and that's because there's still that direct mixing of sexual fluids and so there's that definite chance for pathogens to pass from male to female or female to male. Also there is a small risk of unwanted side effects as well so again if you're considering taking hormonal contraception make sure you check with your doctor and make an informed decision about those, um, about those side effects. Our second kind of contraception is called barrier contraception. Now, barrier contraception works by forming a physical barrier to prevent the sperm and the egg from meeting. And there are three main kinds. There is condoms, um, or maybe more specifically, male condoms. Now, the condom is a sheath uh, normally made out of very thin rubber, um, nitrile rubber, that goes over the penis and it catches the sperm when they're ejaculated and prevents them from ever making direct contact um, with the female body. Now, the next one we've got is called the diaphragm or the cap, and it is a rubber disc that is placed over the cervix to prevent sperm from swimming into the vagina. So if we look here, there we can see at the top of the vagina, at the bottom of the cervix, we've got that blue uh, sort of structure there. That is our diaphragm or our cap. And it just means that any sperm that uh, are in the vagina cannot swim past it. It just blocks the cervix, so therefore they can't get to the uterus. It's also coated with spermicide as well, which will help to kill any sperm cells that do hit it. Lastly, we've got female condoms. Now, this is a rubber sheath that is inserted into the vagina um, and it catches sperm there. So you can see that rubber sheath there. That is our female condom. Now, there's a bit of a sort of a, a, a common myth that after sex, um, it can be rinsed out and reused. Um, that is against manufacturer's advice. If you ever find yourself using these, dispose of it after use. Do not wash it out and reuse it. Now, in terms of effectiveness, barrier contraception can be highly effective when used properly. So condoms, uh, male condoms, 
are 98% effective. That means out of 100 couples regularly having sex using condoms, um, 98 will not get pregnant in the course of a year and only two will. And the, low, the, le the least effective is the cat, but it's still not bad at 84% effectiveness there. Sometimes the sperm are still able to swim around the sides of it and end up passing through the cervix. And sometimes it can be dislodged during sex as well, which is why its effectiveness is lower. The condoms, both male and female, help to prevent the transmission of STIs because they prevent the mixing of the male and female sexual fluids, provided they're used properly, which is um, placed on or inserted before any sexual intercourse takes place. It's, lastly, it's worth noting that the cap does not prevent the spread of STIs, and that's because the um, female and male sexual fluids do still mix in the, in the vagina. It's just that it prevents um, pregnancy by preventing the sperm from moving upwards. Now, the final thing to look at is the idea of assisted reproductive technologies, or ART, um, which is sometimes just known as fertility treatment. Now, this is something that some of you listening to this video are likely to experience at some point in your lives. You know, if you're trying to have children and you've been trying for a year or so and, or, or a couple of years and, and just not got pregnant at all yet, then you may decide that fertility treatment is an option that you want to explore. Now, there are two main kinds of fertility treatment that we need to know about. The first one is IVF or in vitro fertilization. Now, this used to be what uh, people used to know this as test tube uh, babies. Now, I'm going to cross that out because that is a really insulting term. A, no test tubes are involved, so it's scientifically wrong. But also, B, it's pretty insulting to the children that result. These, these babies aren't test tube babies. They're just regular babies where fertilization happens uh, via a different process. Now, um, the first step of this is that the mother is given large doses of two hormones, FSH and LH, and that causes a large number of eggs to be released from the ovaries. What happens next is that the eggs are then collected um, by the, uh, by, by the uh, doctors and they are fertilized by sperm in the laboratory rather than inside the mother. What happens then? is some of the embryos are allowed to develop and grow until they are a ball of cells. And one or two of those embryos will then be implanted back into the mother's uterus. So this is why test tube baby is insulting. This is, this is still a regular pregnancy in which, um, in which it's carried to term and given birth to you naturally in the way that any other baby would be. The only difference is that the fertilization process happens outside the body rather than inside the body. Another kind of treatment we need to know about is called clomiphene therapy. Now, in clomiphene therapy, um, what this does is um, clomiphene is a drug that stimulates the production of large amounts of LH. And this can be used to treat infertility in women who don't ovulate. And this is this is certainly the case with plenty of women. So, you know, I, I have a friend, in fact, for, for whom this was the case, who um, she was maturing eggs every menstrual cycle as, as is normal and expected, but those eggs were never escaping her ovaries because uh, she wasn't producing enough LH. That's it. The end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.